Welcome to the second of this series of webinars on practical aspects of applying continuous cover forestry. My name is Bill Mason. I'm the chair of the CCFG. And with Michelle's help, I'll try to make this hour run as smoothly and enjoyably as possible. I'm honored today to introduce Phil Morgan, who will be presenting to us in a second. Phil's one of the leading experts, both practical and theoretical in Britain, in the use of continuous cover forestry. He's worked in various parts of the world and now lives in Wales, where his efforts are focused on the transformation of upland coniferous plantations to productive mixed forests. Phil was my predecessor as chair of the continuous cover forestry group, and he he was the past president of ProSilva, which is the European Association of Organizations and Individuals who promote close nature forestry. He holds other important roles within the CCF close to nature forestry world, but I think that's enough for me. And Phil, I'll hand over to you to take us through the next half hour. Over to you. Right. Um, thank you, Bill, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to talk about upland silviculture and transformation of plantations to continuous cover. Um, these webinars that have been set up by CCFG are a great opportunity to share experiences and ideas, but then also to engage in some very useful discussion afterwards. Um, only I just need to say that you know the banner and logo on on the, on the uh, opening slide there um, uh, and you know they do I, I'm speaking for myself and rather than I'm not representing any of the views that CCFG might have um, I'm just simply using the banner as um, testimony to my affiliation. Um, this here is a typical Welsh upland Sitka forest called Brynaradion. This is one of the best examples of how CCF is applied to even age spruce in the uplands. Elevation is 200 meters to 249 meters, so it's quite high, quite exposed. Um, <clears throat> there is a, there aren't many species here. It's 85% Sitka spruce, 10 Japanese larch, which we're losing at the moment, and 5% lodgepole pine. Um, that is the first plant, the first rotation. Uh, that species mix is now changing. Um, it's an even age plantation. Um, this is um, 680 hectares, but it was in, in, um, established in three different forests. Uh, one of them was in 1960, one of them 1975 and, 1990, and 1983. Um, so those three uh, age um, classes have been, even age blocks have been brought together under one ownership. Um, and uh, the, the forest has been under transformation to continuous cover for 21 years. You can see here Sitka spruce, you can see a bit of larch, a bit of lodgepole pine. Um, uh, there we are. This is the Sitka, the larch, the lodgepole, and typical forest road. And just between the trunks here, you can hint that something's going, there's a hint of something going on. There's a bit of a group that's opened up there. So we will talk about um, uh, how these forests evolve when you start managing them under the principles of CCF. So applying CCF to even age spruce plantations, um, it requires an approach to management and it requires the application of CCF principles. It's simple, it's commercial, adaptive and sustainable. On the th simple theme, Graduated density is the type of, um, well, this is the thinning pattern that you employ. It's a one in four, and it's applied in two operations. At T1, thinning one, racks are cut at one in eight rows, leaving seven rows in between. Um, at T2, four or five years later, uh, the middle rack is cut out, um, and this leaves three rows on either side of the two racks. So. You have a one in four operation, um, uh, but it's, um, uh, uh, sorry, one in four rows are removed, but in two operations. 
and the selective thinning in the sides. This is very, very, very important. You don't just cut systematic racks in the crop. Selection is one of the most important elements of all of this. In, and um, um, at T1 and at T2, you take out trees because they're of lower quality. If they come, if they're larger trees, and if they are close to each other or they come in groups because um, <coughs> uh, these things do happen in, uh, to come in little clusters, you don't feel inhibited by taking four or five trees out in a row in the first row and maybe four or three in the next, uh, and again in the third row. The middle row at T1 is left unthinned because it's going to be removed at T2. Um, but um, because of the selection principles that are applied, um, the, um, um, the, the, the small groups uh, and little gaps apply. The unthinned stabilizer row uh, contributes to mitigating the, the, the effects of wind blow. Um, now, all the interventions which follow T1 and T2 are no longer called thinning, they're selective felling, because you start to fell target diameter. Um, uh, and then as subsequent operations uh, occur, the forest is thinned and a mosaic of stand types emerges. Um, more of this as we go along. Uh, I should also say that T1 and T2 can be applied to the majority of sites in upland Wales. Um, so you could thin virtually everywhere, first and second thin, um, but this does not guarantee a successful path to transformation. Deep peat or peaty glaze sites can be thinned um, at an appropriate top height, but low production class and sensitive site conditions prevent access to the site beyond the second thin. You just can't get down the wreck, you start trashing the place. Um, so these are places that should not have been planted in the first place, and um, uh, we wouldn't plant them if it was new planting uh, um, uh, 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 at this time. So some of these site constraints can be overcome with well-designed infrastructure, but peat soils are not really suitable for growing trees and their future management has to be considered in a different light. And you will find any within any forest in Wales that you're going to have a mix of all these different site types and you're going to have to react differently to them. Here's a picture of T1. You can see the rack came up here. There are seven rows in between on the side. Uh, row one, row two, row three. There's about 30% of the trees removed in this first row, 20 in the next, 10 in the next, and then 0% in the middle one. See the top height is quite low here. This is a representation of what graduated density looks like. It was devised by Talis Kalnas and he thinned at one in six. So there are six trees here uh, and there is one row removed. So two on either side and then the stabilizer. Whereas this is a one in eight, which is what I advocate uh, and which is more suitable to upland conditions where you have one row, three rows thinned here, I say I've got 40, 20, 10% here in the thinning. You can vary that, of course. There's no removal here, which is the stabilizer row. And then at the second thinning, the stabilizer is removed and you have the old rack here. Um, and because these are adjacent to the old rack, there's no thinning in these two rows and you thin 30, 20% in these ones. And these percentages are just guide, but they give you the idea that selection is taking place. Selection is crucial. Picture of T2. You can see the top height is much higher here. We've had five years growth since the next time. This isn't the same stand, by the way. Um, and this is what it might look like in subsequent um, uh, operations. Um, that the, the first row is abandoned. And the second uh, row removal at T2 becomes the permanent extraction rack. As you go on, you can apply the, pr the principles of graduated density by skipping some of these permanent racks as well. So that even though you're just doing selective felling, you're still maintaining this differential in between thinned and unthinned um, and, and um, you know, creating uh, these areas where there are different densities or different basal areas. Keeping with the simple theme, infrastructure is 
a very, very important um, uh, 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 consideration. Um, you, you have to plan the road system. Very often, this isn't planned for you. It's been established at the, it's been um, laid out at the establishment phase. But um, if you are uh, beginning a transformation process in Woodland, you have the opportunity to, decide, to, to design the track network. Um, and um, when first thinning takes place, the rack layout is planned to serve the thinning racks and link to the road network. So fresh brash from the track will support the first intervention, but requires surfacing before further operations due to the lack of new brash. Um, you know, you can integrate stacking areas and all these different things as part of the design, but essentially the racks are cut at one in eight row centers at the first inning. Um, and if the crop is at two meter spacing, um, if the crop is at two meter spacing, but a tighter spacing as might happen in older stands, um, um, you know, that are planted at one in eight, you have to remove two rows. So the racks there have to be wider and you maybe have to mitigate for the wider rack. Uh, this is a, um, a, a, a map of the forest. And you can see the road network is in these dark uh, black colored lines and all these dotted green lines are tracks. And you can see that, you know, it's quite widespread and that there are tracks all the way through this forest. This forest is 680 hectares. Typical forest road, what's it for? It's for hauling timber. And these logs here have come out of this forest. Um, this is a track, slightly lower spec, um, but you need the stone on the track in order to be able to support the, uh, the forders with repeat, um, with repeat passes of the forder, bringing the timber out of racks on into, 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 uh, towards the forest road. Uh, this is a, an aerial photograph that's been annotated. You can see that this here is the forest road. This here is the track and these red dotted lines are the racks. Now I've gone to a lot of trouble to produce this because it was a particularly fussy um, place. Um, this is not first rotation, this is a restock stand and we had to contend with these dreadful deep um, uh, um, drains because this was drain and dollop and this has actually compromised the, 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 the thinning pattern. Uh, I mentioned that um, uh, working in restock is sometimes complicated by um, brash mats um, and um, <coughs> unplanted areas uh, on the brash mat. Um, and here it's been complicated by these deep drains. Blue is, is a watercourse. Infrastructure, it's highly disruptive. Um, you know, there's a permanent loss of landscape features. Uh, design has to mitigate against environmental impact, but also not mentioned on the slide here against archaeology archaeology as well. Um, a digger can do an awful lot of damage in a short amount of time. Um, but, you know, there are also opportunities for microhabitats. You know, we get club mosses on some of the old quarries and quarry restoration uh, provides the opportunity for planting unusual species that might not have um, a, a, a productive value. And if you want to introduce, um, uh, say, shrub species or berries or pollen um, producing species, you can actually enhance the environment for, um, for, 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 for biodiversity and wildlife. So there are opportunities there. Now, the other theme I wanted to explore was commercial. So um, the thinning pattern is a cost-effective way of thinning, um, cutting a rack and taking out um, trees selectively. You tend not to low thin. You um, you have a uh, essentially a crown thinning, removing larger trees. The larger average tree size makes the first thinnings more commercial than the conventional way of thinning. Um, and this is the same again at T2. When you thin for the second time, you're taking a whole rack out. You're taking every tree along that rack. 
increasing the average tree size and also selectively thinning in the two rows either side of that second rack. Um, so um, the fact that we are creating these groups at a very early stage, and when I say groups, these are not half hectare groups, these are tiny little groups, but the, the point is, is, is that around the edge of a group, um, <coughs> light will persist for a lot longer, the rack will not close over as quickly around the groups as it would do uh, on, 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 a, on a lightly thinned or a, a low thinned rack. Um, and therefore, uh, light will um, concentrate in these little holes um, and the trees round about the edges of these small groups will respond faster. Um, whereas the opposite will happen in the areas which haven't been so heavily thin because the quality was good and it was, um, uh, there would have been an opportunity cost in taking out small trees at an early stage. Um, uh, so, um, the, these trees um, uh, uh, are growing faster uh, and they are becoming bigger. So by the time you get to T3, you're beginning to take out trees with a certain proportion of log in it and also bar material. Um, and this is making the whole process uh, economic. Um, there are other things here if you've had time to read it, but uh, there's you're minimizing the amount of premature felling on a tree by tree basis and harvesting big trees is efficient. Planting casts, planting casts are limited to species enrichment and um, essentially the forest is resilient, biologically automated and sustainable. This is a very useful, it's a lovely little slide uh, and I borrowed this from Pro Silver Island presentation because it makes the point very, very, very clearly. Here you have clear fell and replant, here you have continuous cover. And same, same little graph here, but contrasting uh, number of stems per hectare against diameter. And here uh, you have a price per meter cube. So there are two lines here. The blue line is the number of stems per hectare and the red line uh, is the price size curve. Uh, and the hatched area is the area which has been removed. This is clear fell and replant. You take everything away, typical bell-shaped curve, out it comes. Uh, whereas with continuous cover, you have the reverse J and this is all you're taking away. Now, where is this? It's here, it's at the top of the price size curve. Whereas here you're taking out small, medium, and a few large trees. And where are they? They're, they're way down the price size curve. This is also very useful. Um, there are three colors here, Douglas fir in red, uh, larch is in blue, and the green is Sitka spruce. There are two lines. There's a dotted line and a solid line. Uh, the, the dotted line is the uh, potential value of this, the, 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 these size classes along the bottom here. Uh, and the um, solid line is the standing value. Uh, potential value integrates two things. It in integrates the growth, uh, the growth rate rather, uh, with the um, uh, increase in value. Um, so these here are uh, the values, the future values of trees, um, um, uh, as opposed to the standing value here. So here the tree is continuing to grow in value. It's a different curve. It's the same curve, but it's much, much, much more flat. It isn't as valuable in Sitka spruce. Um, but the same principle applies. Here it's growing above. Uh, there is an increase in value, an increase in value as the tree grows on at a point where it plateaus or falls and it crosses here. And at this point here, you have a target diameter. So at about 93 for Douglas fir, there's a target diameter and the, the target diameter for Sitka is around 65. Um, you know, these are differences because these different species are worth different amounts of money. Um, uh, but this gives you a useful idea of why it is CCF harvests larger dimension trees. And this is Sitka spruce. This is the uplands and you can see that <coughs> early transformation, there is good regeneration appearing here. There's some enrichment planting here as well. 
Uh, you can see native vegetation, which is growing underneath the canopy. But look at the size of the stump. You know, this is T4, um, if you like. It's the fourth intervention and trees, uh, the, the, the increment is being harvested in these large trees. Similar sort of picture, but slightly different here. Um, this is the original rack. You can see that this old callus stump here covered in moss is um, where the very first rack was cut at T1. And this is um, the fourth, fifth intervention. And um, But you can see that there's a, a different kind of group that's emerged here. I was talking about very small groups earlier on, uh, which potentially can close over here. Um, this group here is much bigger. Um, but why? You can just, if you follow the contour, there's a bit of a re-entrant here, and then off the contour goes over there. This here is the top of a watercourse. This is an area which is wet. This is an area where the trees are less stable and they've blown down. And you can see that the regeneration is more advanced in this place than it is underneath the canopy. Um, so these groups here are going to appear as you thin and, um, uh, and uh, uh, you open up the woodland. Um, now, these trees did not go down, they were not unstable, and therefore these have had the opportunity to put on more increment, um, uh, rather than having to be clear felled if you were squaring off in response to blow. This shows you the type of machinery that's used in continuous cover. Um, very, very typical harvesting machinery. Um, obviously, we would rather have the smaller machines. These are tending to get a little bit big, but you know these middle-sized machines um, uh, are perfectly suitable. And you can see the rack layout here um, on, on this bank in the distance. So, some reasons why you should do it. Um, transformation to CCF brings forward cash flows. Um, it delivers a stable cash yield. It avoids the cost of replanting. It produces larger, more valuable trees, and management and harvesting costs are quite moderate. CCF grows and maintains the capital value of the forest in perpetuity, and it reduces biological risks, which we either, um, that, you know, the, 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 I, you know, that could be in response to climate change that we're all having to contend with at the moment. It's also adaptive and it's sustainable, um, and there's ways of, you know, measuring these things. So here we have working circles. Uh, working circles in this, again, the same forest here. The green areas are permanent areas. Um, <coughs> some of them have got constraints on them, which are terrain constraints, and meaning that harvester forwarders can't work in these darker areas. There's winch work that's required there. But interestingly, here you see that you have red and pink areas. Now, these are clear fill working circles um, and that you uh, have to clear fill in areas for different reasons. There are terrain constraints here. It's not possible to develop the infrastructure in this part of the forest. It just wouldn't be environmentally sustainable. And these red areas here are areas that were planted, planted on deep peat in the 1970s um, and uh, which have got very, very low yield classes in, on them and will be clear filled. Some of these areas we have attempted to thin on, um, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, but that thinning isn't sustainable and you can't manage them by continuous cover. So these working circles really bring together um, similar um, uh, site conditions. You know, you can't do the same thing everywhere. You need to respond to site conditions. You need to be opportunistic and maximize the site potential. Um, you, but you have to be respectful of site conditions and also opportunities for ecosystem management and to be adaptive. This here on the right hand side is how we've itemized and how we've defined the different working groups in this forest. We also use an index for transformation, um, <clears throat> which is slightly different, I mean, you will see later on, is that as uh, we, we, we have done some work um, uh, 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 supporting a PhD student in Aberystwyth, and these are the five stages of transformation that we've identified um, within um, the transformation process. So preparatory, regeneration initiation, structural development, and structural achievement. This is equilibrium. This is what we all aspire to. Um, and um, 
brilliant idea on is either in the preparatory, the regeneration initiation, and a very small area is in the structural development one. This will be made clear in a moment. So here again, stand types, you can see that this integrates the stand types. You've got thinnable, sorry, preparatory regeneration initiation structural development. Zero structural development and structural achievement. But here in the regeneration phase, it's actually been split into two. Uh, there's an awful lot more. And there's 105 in preparatory. This one here is not yet in transformation. These are restock sites, which are actually growing. Uh, and they're not even in the preparatory phase. These here are the working circles, which are not part of, um, <coughs> we, we, which really don't, um, um, are not in transformation at all, but they are stand types nonetheless. And so this here is a summary of all the different stand types within the working circles um, and in different stages of transformation. Stand type map shows you that it's quite a different dif um, distribution from the working circles. This is a list of, this is taken directly from the CCFG website. These are the principles that you apply and it's only by applying these principles at every stage that you actually get to this point here of structural achievement. There's some representations of these different stages. This is the preparatory phase. And you can see that racks have been cut and there's some thinning under these small groups that are appearing. And um, this here's the regeneration initiation where um, <coughs> there are uh, medium-sized trees, larger trees, which are responding to these group effects. Uh, and there is still a small number of trees there as well, which um, uh, these are counted as trees rather than poles. Um, structural development, we're just moving a lot forward, further there. We're getting this better um, distribution within the diameter groups here, and this is basal area. Um, and here we have blue appearing, um, which is structural achievement, because the blue are the poles. In the previous one, there was no blue, there were no poles in here, because these are all trees from the first cohort. Whereas here, these trees here do not have an age, they only have a size. Uh, and therefore, these blue ones here are trees which possibly grew from some of these, or seed, from seed from some of these, and have managed to go through regeneration um, into pole size. And we're about five minutes, please. Thank you, thank you Bill. Um, now, this is a good picture of what an irregular forest in transformation can look like. Upstone stumps, stumps provide habitat and showing that CCF integrates ecological principles into the forest management and mixed ground flora, there's heather, there's vaccinium, there's all sorts of things here which uh, are growing underneath productive conifers. Uh, this here is what will happen in groups. I was showing you groups earlier on. Um, and this is a, uh, a low yield class site, not very productive. Um, we've attempted to thin it and this is what has happened. Uh, but this is a very, very, very small group. It's probably less than a hectare. This is another group that's happened, an alternative scenario, um, different site type. Um, and this has happened for different reasons. This was a very well drained site, but it was a tornado effect and we lost some of these trees. Um, and, um, but as you can see, we didn't square anything off here. Um, and we've got regeneration coming along with this ground vegetation as well. Same site, um, enrichment planting here. This is Douglas fir. Remember the price size curves, the potential value, uh, and the standing value uh, graph that I showed you. Douglas fir does not normally grow at this elevation and this sort of exposure, but within this, this, this forest environment where you know, we have dead wood, we have you know, a lots of edge effect, Douglas fir is growing. Western red cedar, this is another thing. This is all natural regeneration of Sitka spruce. If you don't come in with enrichment planting and you have such a sport, poor species composition to start off with, you need to enrich. 
again, examples of production in this and maintaining this has just had an intervention and it looks as if it's fully stocked. A slightly different scenario there. Um, lots of very big trees have been taken out. You can see a group here which is responding and here uh, the felling is quite recent and there's no regeneration on the ground yet. Typical, uh, again, highly productive, dead wood present, regeneration on the ground. This is a difference. This is a quite a different stand. I mentioned the different P years. Um, this was planted in, in 1960, um, <clears throat> and therefore it was already um, uh, 40 years old before we started managing the stand. It was also planted um, at 1.8 meter spacing and therefore 3,600 stems per hectare. Um, this leaves with you with quite a challenge because of the number of stems that we have there and also because of the canopy clo well, clo early canopy closure you have at that sort of spacing and the stem exclusion that takes place there. A lot of these small trees are being retained with very small crowns and they're unable to respond and that leaves with issues within the transformation. In order to manage these sort of forests, you have to regulate and monitor what you do. Um, and um, this here is one of the things that we've done. We've had two inventories in Brinner Ideon. Um, this here is a map. It shows the map of the forest. There's a grid that's being superimposed over the forest, creating 169 sample plots that are then measured. These are permanent sample plots. This is uh, a graphical representation of uh, the plots that uh, uh, with an angle count the trees are counted so it's probability proportional to size the further away uh, sorry the larger the tree the further away it can be from the sample plot this is the center of the plot and this is the center of the plot where are the problem now? this is the first intervention you can see a lot of stems per hectare and there's very little underneath a more recent photograph will show you a very different looking stand. Um, we also measure pulls within a fixed 10 meter radius and then regeneration within three subplots, which are 1.5 meter radius. This is the results for the whole forest. This is a summary for the whole forest. And you can see here pie charts here showing you species composition and these <coughs> bar charts here showing you the stem size distribution. The little bit of color at the top there is the same as that there. It's the um, uh, non sitka spruce. There's an awful lot of blue in the first, first cohort of trees here. Um, but this is quite interesting. Uh, um, this shows you uh, the poles. Uh, some of these poles are obviously small trees that haven't grown because there's quite a lot of um, uh, these sample plots that land in uh, heavily checked uh, areas and those trees will count as poles. But this again is regeneration. There are one, two, three classes of regeneration and other conifers are beginning to feature in there because of the enrichment planting. I will come uh, to wrapping up. Sorry to press you. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm nearly there, Bill. Um, so this just shows you, this is the, 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 the stand which um, I, I, I claim to be problematic. Um, you can see that there are a lot of very small diameter trees in it there. Um, whereas this here is a, quite a different stand and you can see that the, the DBHs um, come out much further and there are fewer smaller trees and there's a different distribution of size classes in there. So the inventory is incredibly useful. It allows you to actually look at these things in great detail and then to come up with uh, prescriptions for how to manage. Um, this is um, a useful figure. Um, this is a provisional long-term target for a growing stock. 30 meter squared per hectare is the sort of target that you want to be aiming for and this will vary now, I would need a whole new talk to go through this slide here, um, but um, I very, very, very quickly, um, this actually shows you what it is we're trying to achieve. So this is to do with targets and modeling as well. Um, uh, 
these pictures on here are not from Brunei Idea, I'm from Kumnat era where CCFG had a, uh, a, a meeting there, CCFG Wales, I should say. And, and, and these were a clumsy attempt on my part to try and illustrate these, these graphs uh, and, and diagrams that Jean-Philippe Schutz has produced. These are the sort, uh, he is one of the best people at, at modeling equilibrium uh, and, and, and also transformation as well. Um, um, but if people are interested in this and they would like to have some more discussion, we could possibly look at this quite, quite uh, um, in more detail. This is how the size classes move from the different diameter groups. But this is the most interesting one as well. This line here, this is a logarithmic scale and this is a linear one. Whereas here, these are both linear scales. This line here is the red line and there's a bump in it. And this is to do with modeling this is the ideal J, um, and 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 um, uh, but without going into too much detail, what we need to do in order to determine equilibrium is look at this cohort here of very small trees in order to be able to determine whether we have a stand. Now, some of you may recognise this picture. Uh, it was only taken yesterday. Um, but this is where we had our lunch break um, on the CCFG's 25th anniversary meeting in 2016. This had been hit by blow. These trees had not been cleared up and they're still there today. And another picture again showing how these irregular structures, these mosaics work. This is the edge of these trees. These trees are very widely spaced, but there is a little canopy effect here. And this regeneration and enrichment planting is reacting very differently to the regeneration in the open area. This is having to be respaced. So, Bill, I'm there. I'm summing up. Um, I'm summing up now. And this is. Equilibrium, at equilibrium, you have continuity of timber production, and it's provided from a growing stock consisting of trees of various sizes, from seedlings to fully grown trees. And this is optimized by harvesting the forest increment from quality trees. The challenge in transformation is to maintain and close the production loop with a single cohort of trees to a point where both plantation and regeneration trees contribute to production, avoiding a shelterwood phase. But by applying the principles of continuous cover and using selection, mosaics of different stand types will emerge in response to site variation and to wind effects. This will allow every tree in the forest to reach its full potential to produce timber and to support the forest ecosystem. Okay, thank you. Okay, Bill, thank you very much. Um, please stop sharing. Um, and we've got quite a number of questions. And Ruff, what I'll try and do is to ask the questions on behalf of people who put them in the chat. And then I'll intervene at intervals with one or two of my own. Yes. Um, one from Ben Clinch. Up in Murray, which is how important is the stabilizer role for providing brash or allowing the forwarder to have access? Yeah, the, 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 the stabilizer row um, is, is only a stabilizer at the first thinning um, because, um, uh, well, uh, because it's the middle row in the seven rows which you leave in between the one in the racks at one and eight. So um, T1 and T2, there is absolutely no problem with um, uh, you know, brash underneath the machine because you're taking out a whole row. It's only subsequently that you know, your thinning is entirely selective. Uh, and this is why you, you tend to, to de designate, you know, you have two rows that you can choose from when you're at one and four. You can have the first one or the second row, but come T3 or the next intervention, you, you decide that that first row is abandoned. You leave that, you let the, the brash break down and regeneration happen there. And so that you're concentrating the brash only on the permanent rack. Now, 
you can apply that principle further on by um, skipping racks. Um, if you uh, at at um, the third intervention, you would come back in on the T2 rack. Uh, but in late, at later interventions, you go further apart. The further you go apart, the more space, you know, the more spatial um, uh, differentiation you need within the stand. And you will find that the harvest ahead will not be able to reach the furthest trees. But because you're only felling large trees, it doesn't matter. You can, you can, you can fill the odd big tree, which is too far away by hand, by, 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 by chainsaw, and then process it on the rack and then concentrate all that brash on as few racks as possible. Um, this is, you know, a definite challenge. This is why I made a point about infrastructure. Infrastructure is there in order to protect the site. You need to have stone tracks in order to be able to travel um, um, uh, and, and reach the stand. Okay, there's a couple of related questions I think here. And the first one is in relation to the action when you started the process was this something you had to mark yourself oh, was that about marking bill yeah yeah um yeah the, 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 there's always a certain amount of work involved um that um uh you the, 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 at the start of the process the most important thing to do is to get the rack layout properly planned and laid out and you can't generally, you know, generally you wouldn't ask a contractor simply to go and do that. You know, the, you, know the, you, you need to have a, a good understanding of the site, of the topography, of the constraints and all these things. You need to identify the areas uh, where, which are peaty, for example, and that you need to isolate them um, so that, you know, if you uh, 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 keep, not necessarily to keep away from them, but in order to be able to work the more stable areas which are adjacent to, to them. Um, uh, tracking does need some careful planning, particularly if you have some serious topography as well. Uh, you have to understand these things, you know, need to know what the constraints are. And I did point out that there were some areas of Brenner idea on that are designated as clear fell, simply because it wasn't possible or economically or environmentally viable to push too far and to cut tracks on very steep slopes. Um, uh, so all this requires the forest manager to do that planning. It's only when you get past and th and then sorry, and then and then you you the, the racks are then laid out. It's on a very simple one in eight pattern. You know you can give your contractor instructions to do that, um, and then you could do some sample marking if you're wanting to uh, induct or initiate a, a contractor who isn't familiar with the system. Uh, but generally, you know, contractors pick these things up rather quickly. It becomes important to mark only when the trees are more valuable, and that's past T1, past T2, it's in T3. That's when you start marking. And if you have good contractors, that third intervention may not be marked. It's subsequently when the trees do become very valuable and that, you know, you're considering all sorts of other things that, um, that marking then becomes absolutely essential. Right. There's quite a range of questions here, and my apologies to the audience if I don't get all of them in. Um, one question to do with the enrichment planting. When would you start doing this, and yeah. how do you attempt to control the spacing to influence future branching? Right. Um, Yes, uh, it's a very interesting question that, you know, that, that, that if, you, if you're thinning at the right time, if, if you're thinning in a stand where the top height is 12, 15, um, uh, the, and, and you're on a fertile site or productive site, uh, not necessarily fertile, but, but, but if you're on a productive site, that the, you're on the very, very steep part of the growth curve, and therefore that you find that you might be doing T1, and within four years, the rack is completely closed over. So it's time for T2 and you take out that middle rack. It's only when you get into subsequent interventions that the stand starts slowing down, that you start reducing the basal area. No, sorry, the, 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 the you, you, you're moving on into a different part of the growing phase and, and, and that um, you're beginning to reduce the basal area. 
um, because you know essentially in the first two thinnings you might be thinning at marginal thinning intensity because it's growing so quickly um, and and and, and uh, you don't want to over thin for, for reasons of stability um, and, 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 and later on um, things begin to open up so I would not envisage enrichment planting before you have um, a, a, a enough light on the ground. And that would generally be after the third intervention. Um, uh, and, and also you need to be selective with this. It says that I talked about this mosaic, you know, this mosaic can develop at different rates and at different scales and little groups, you know, that, that you, you deliberately create because you're removing poor quality trees may provide opportunities for um, the enrichment planting. So your planters do not want to be uniform. They want to identify the groups. They want to keep off the rack because they're permanent racks and you don't want to trash what you're planting. Uh, and then you plant trees and don't think about spacing. Plant them at one meter spacing, plant 12 trees together at one meter spacing. And then you might have a cone of regeneration on, and, and it won't be regeneration, it'll be enrichment planting. Um, just a quick supplementary on this. I mean, in your talk, you mentioned Western Red Cedar and Douglas fir. I've had a question. Do you consider Western Hemlock as part of your... Um, Western Hemlock is... It's a, it's a tricky one. Um, I do not think we want to limit our species diversity and you know western hemlock grows into very good timber um you know the, there are all sorts of bogey stories about you know hundreds of thousands of stems per hectare and fluting and all the rest of that um i haven't planted any western hemlock but i have western hemlock in my forest because the seed is so small uh, and it travels, I don't know whether it's under the wing of a bird or something, but you know, they, they travel incredible distances. And there was a time, well, there are certain forests that I manage where I pull them up for, 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 for good reason, um, but that depends on the objectives of management. But there are other forests where I let them grow because they may be an important component of the forest in years to come. Question, thanks Paul. The question is kind of related. Um, which I suppose touches on some of the Sitka stands that have been established more recently using genetically improved material. So the question is specific, would you consider transforming an even age Sitka plantation of full sub material to CCF? Um, or would you only recommend this approach for plantations that arose from wild first generation or wild or seed orchard material? I, I, I think that you know the principles of CCF can be applied to any, 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 any plantation. If you're going to transform to CCF, you're going to um, diversify the structure, but you also, you know, the structure is the you know, the, 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 the spatial distribution and also the vertical structure, but it's also the species diversity as well. So if you're starting from any monoculture, irrespective of, you know, how, you know, what seed source or, 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 or what planting material it was, it came from, it, it's not going to be a mixture when I finish working with it. Sorry, it's not going to be a monoculture when I finish working with it. <laughs> um. There's a, a sort of a more general question. Do you have any feel for the comparative growth rate and productivity you find in your CCF stands versus more conventionally managed yeah. forests that you see in Wales? Well, I think that's that that, that you know that, that that there is a tricky question. And uh, I think you know there has been some research done on this. I'm thinking of Kerr and OM. Uh, and they said basically that it was too close to call. Um, so I think, you know, I don't want to make a big deal of it because it's a contentious issue. Um, but I firmly believe um, that it is more productive. It's more productive in a completely different way. And because the two, the two approaches are entirely different and they're monitored in an entirely different ways, it's very, very, very difficult to make a, a fair comparison. 
Um, and it's an argument that I don't really want to sort of engage in. Um, and I, I, I simply, I know that, um, that I'm producing a far higher proportion of saw logs, and you know, one of the little graphs showed that, um, than, um, than, than, than the other system, and that I'm producing a higher quality tree. I'm not just producing that from the first cohort, but I'm also going to produce better quality in the future. And it's just produced in a more efficient way. So um, I leave it to others to make the comparison. But, you know, I firmly believe that this is the way to do it. And, you know, this is going to produce better timber in the future in a much, much more efficient way. And without the, the, the terrible drawbacks that clear felling and replant produce in terms of the environment and water and carbon, you know, come and see my carbon clear fell. How, how, you know, how do you get wood and carbon credits on clear felling? Um, there's a supplementary question from Gareth Browning on the rack layouts and the removal intensities. And it's a question I wondered, which is, do you vary the thinning percentage in the adjacent rows depending on what you evaluate the risk of blow in the stand to be? You, you know, you had the 10%, yes. 20%, the 40%. Yeah, the, the, those percentages are a guide, um, but they're also an indication that you're thinning quite hard. Um, it's, it's very, it, uh, you know, it, it, it isn't the difference in between a, a crown thinning and, 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 a, and a low thinning because you're actually taking groups out. You know, you are looking at the quality. You must always, always, always take out the poorest trees. You must always favor the better quality trees. And, you know, quality comes in clusters and in groups. Um, and, you know, the, the, obviously, if, if you're on an unstable site, if it's a risky, uh, risky operation that, you know that you you will you you will want to hold back a little bit um but um uh, you know uh, maybe this wasn't sufficiently clear in the presentation that i made is is that if if you use the same principles everywhere um the the wind and circumstance will actually do the detailed planning for you that you may thin the same everywhere and because you have a, 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 a less stable site type, you may have a larger group appearing there in, 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 due to a wind event. Uh, and and that, that, that area will be, will be cleared up and that will become a group. And that will be on a shorter rotation than the areas which are standing, which are on a much longer rotation. So the whole forest is going to develop in the uplands you know, it's obviously a different story in, 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 in the lowlands where you have more control. Um, uh, but in the uplands, a lot of it is going to be determined by nature and it's going to be in response to the site types. And this mosaic of different, different stand types is going to evolve. Do you adjust the initial direction of the racks? In, term, in relation to the prevailing wind? No, no. Um, the, 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 the rack direction is determined by two things, really. It's determined by the road layout and by, more than anything, topography. Topography is critical because you need to send a harvester forwarder down a slope, and if any side slope will you know, disrupt you know, will, will, will uh, you know, make, make, make the thing not possible. You know, if, if the side slope operators can't operate on that and they might damage trees and they might da damage themselves as well. And when you get to the later interventions, the two falls or whatever, um, as well as maybe marking because of the value of some of the retained trees, do you actually consider the, their potential stability as in the frame tree concept? Yeah. Um, 
Yes, 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 yes. You, you know, th there is always tr tr trees, you know, trees that are, tr or, you know, bi bi groups are, are, are interesting things that, you know, there are some stands that are one bi group, but generally you can mm -hmm. identify trees Just, that, that would have can... a lay person. Could you say what you mean by a bi group? Oh, sorry. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, sorry about, yeah, by bi group, I mean, Two individual trees that are gen genetically separate, uh, which are have got fused root systems, for example. It might be they, the, the roots may actually be fused, uh, but generally it's mycorrhizal associations and things like that, meaning that the two trees are sharing the same resources underground. Um, uh, and so those two trees are not growing as competing individuals. Um, even though they're very, very close together. And you can see this by, you know, the crown shapes, you know, they're not actually trying to force each other apart or, 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 or gain light from each other. And <coughs> the, the, the stems are cylindrical rather than elliptical if they were competing. Um, so in that case, you might take two of them out. Um, if you take, if you, if you, if you break up a biogroup, you could be destabilizing the tree that remains. And if there's a risk of wind blow, uh, you might as well take them both. Um, but you know, this, you know, this again is all part of the the principle of not worrying about opening groups. Um, if you are in the more advanced stages of transformation, and I think I was trying to demonstrate that through some of the slides I showed at the end of the presentation, where a bad wind event had come in, had knocked out about a hectare, um, and there was this ragged edge all the way around. Well, that ragged edge was never cleared up. It was never squared off, never, never squared off. Those trees were left standing. And those trees are still standing now. Um, so, you know, once you've made that transition from stand stability to individual tree stability, and it's all in depth of crown and all these sort of things that you can actually use as indicators for that, um, I, I wouldn't worry too much about, you know, destabilizing because you're selecting trees. You know, you don't want to take out more than 20 percent 20 of the basal area. That's the that's the guide that you're using. Um, okay, thanks, Phil. Got a question from Graham Gill, which goes back to your truck incident in Soto. Um, yeah. He was commenting that one of your figures suggested a road truck incident of about 80 something meters per hectare, which seemed quite a large investment. And whether though you were concerned at all about a carbon impact from the quarry. Yeah. Yes. Well. Yeah. Thank you, Graham, for that because um, it. Yes. This is. This is. This is certainly something that is of concern. Um, uh, that you know, road building is a very costly, uh, but also carbon greedy uh, business, and developing this infrastructure. Um, uh, you know, that does require an awful lot of work. Um, there's also maintenance as well. Uh, obviously, that's a lot less costly, but um, uh, it, it does impact. And it's certainly something that needs to be considered as part of an analysis or a model. Um, uh, and and um, no, I, I'm very aware of that, 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 that that's something that, that, that needs to be looked at. Okay. Um, I've got one more question, I think, which I haven't picked up, which is to do with the possibility of heterobasidium or foamies on the regeneration as a result of the previous stand and whether this was a concern at all. Um, so foamies or heterobasidium, that, 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 these would be rot. Um, that you know that is present in the stumps. Um, uh, I you know this is not a problem that we've had with re regeneration, um, but as I've said in the presentation, we're desperately waiting for that regeneration to turn into poles and for poles to turn into small wood, and and into 
you know, we, we aren't there yet. Um, all I would say in answer to the question is, is that the, the forest is very diverse. The forest is very open. The forest is dynamic. Um, the trees are not under stress. All these different organisms are there. They're part of the ecosystem. They're part of the system. Um, and there that I would assume that the trees would be able to deal with pests such as that. You know, there may be factors that you know tip things in one particular, but the forest is being managed as an ecosystem. Uh, it's an ecosystem that produces timber. If you don't produce timber from this forest ecosystem, it closes over. Um, so timber production is an essential element of managing the ecosystem. And I think it, it, it's, it, 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 it is self-regulating. Okay, um, we're just about to end. We thank you very much for your time. I've got a kind of myth, more philosophical question for you, Phil, which relates, if you think back to when you started out in your professional career, and to where you are now, what would you advise someone who's just starting to think about the possibility of applying alternative silvicultural systems to upland conifer forests in Britain? You know, what have you learned? What, what's the key message that you would like to get across to someone who has just started out? The key message, I think, well, is that there's nothing to be afraid of. It's simple. Um, and I, I, when I start, I, I, I've always been interested in irregular silviculture from the very start of my career. When I was at university, I was interested in it and I worked in France. Um, uh, but I was very, very lucky that at the beginning of my career in, 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 in Wales, um, I was able to work with Talis Kalnas and, you know, he, 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 he was, you know, he introduced me to an awful lot of very simple, basic approaches to things. And I think this is the key thing. It is simple. It is basic. If, in, if, if you look at the principles of CCF and simply apply them, you know, you, you, you will not go wrong. You will obviously be on a learning curve because you're starting out on something, but there's nothing, nothing, nothing to be afraid of um, uh, because, you know, the first two thinnings, you know, it's not going to blow down because you've thinned. Um, it, and, and, you know, it, it's, it's, it then simply grow, go, goes on and on. And I think one of the best things Talis ever showed me was is is that he used to manage coed and fluid, which has just been sold, by the way. Um, and there's part of that called Cabantum, which is on the Berwyn. And he did all these his thinnings and this sort of stuff early on, and he was working for Shot and Paper Company then. And um, you know, <coughs> all the local foresters said, "Oh, look, 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 look at this! You know, you've got some wind blow." Anyway, Talis tidied up the wind blow as part of his next thinning intervention. And those same people came around saying, oh, what a beautiful thinning. Now, the thing with CCF is, is that you never stop. You're always coming in every four or every five years, you'll be back into the same stands. If you have a large enough forest, you'll be working in that forest every single year. And, but you're just working around the forest. You always have an opportunity to tidy up the wind blow and the wind blow is the tree that you didn't know how to mark. You didn't dare mark it. You know, it's the, the nature took it out. Um, and sometimes nature's hard. Sometimes nature, you know, does things that, you know, you think are unnecessary, but there's a balance in the end. And, you know, these holes soon close over. Okay. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you for your time. Thank you all for attending. As I said, I think, there will be a recording available on our website in a few days time. Just to say that our next webinar is due on the 24th of June um, and we'll be 
given by Gareth Browning, who's going to be talking about applying CCF on steep ground and with big trees, based on his experience in the Northern Lakes. So again, on behalf of everybody, Bill, thanks very much for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Goodbye.